Good morning, everybody. Hope you had a good weekend and you're ready for the week. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. If you've got any comments, concerns, just go ahead and type them in. So here we go. First thing I was going to show you, I ran across this. I think it's a, this is a great indicator of why what we do is so important. It's looking at the history of a 75% stock, 25% bond strategy, and how that would have affected people differently. And you see, we get jaded because we only look at the world through our eyes. But look at this. This is saying if somebody had a, a million dollar portfolio for 30, uh, how long would it last for 30 years if you retired in different years? And look at how close these are. If you retired in 60, in uh, 1946, that million dollars would have last, or would allow you to pull out 65.5 and then ran out 30 years. And ran out 30 years. Where if you just retired three years later, it would have allowed you to pull out huge amounts more, 103 thousand dollars a year for 30 years before it ran out. So not a lot of difference there. So who of us is smart enough to tell the client to, to, uh, they're in the uh, 1946 versus 1949 era. And then you go back to the 1973-75. So in 73 if you retired, you would have been able to pull out $43,000 only. And if you'd waited till 75, just two years later, retired just two years later, look at what would have happened. 79000 before it ran out. $79,000 a year for 30 years before it ran out. That's, I mean, we're looking at almost double, just a three years difference, two years difference, then 77 versus 80. And again, they didn't even look at 1999 versus 2000. How big a difference would that have been, guys? Or 2007 versus 2008. So are we, is anybody, are any of us smart enough to know that the year our clients retire we're not going to have a market downturn. I mean, did, I've been talking about market downturn for six months, and then it finally happened, right? But did, was I guaranteed? If I, if I knew, if I was guaranteed that the market was going to go down the next six months, what would I have done? If I knew for sure the market was going to go down, what would I have done? I would have taken my entire fortune and done what? I wouldn't have got out. I would have shorted the market. Right, Thomas? I would have shorted the market. I would have shorted the market. But we don't know for sure. All we know is that there's one thing that I know about the market. And what is that? There's one thing that I know about the market. What's that? You can't time it right. You can't predict it. The only thing I know about the market is I know nothing about the market. Anybody that tells you they do is full of what? Beans. <laughs> I agree with you, Trevor. I won't say that. I'll agree with you too, Thomas. I won't say those. But here's the thing, guys. I now I've talked to several uh, advisors in the past week who swore that their money manager could manage risk. What are they all telling me right now? They're getting a ton of phone calls from their clients. Why? Because their manager has managed risk? Why are their clients all calling them? Why is their phone ringing off the hook? Hmm, I guess that these managers could only, who said they could manage risk couldn't. It's hilarious. Guys, I've been doing this since 1989. Some of you guys have been doing it a hell of a lot longer, and the longer you've been doing it, the more you know what. Anybody that tells you they can manage risk is full of crap. Because you know what? Anybody who's gotten somebody out of the market before downturn, how many times in a row have they done that? Have they done it two times in a row? No. They do it right, Jay. They do, they do it one time. They, they become famous for, for bailing out at the right time, but they miss the next time, or, or they call what? They, they, they're chicken little, and they call it 15 times before the next one goes out. You can't predict the market. So what we do, yeah, Elaine Gazzarelli, Bruce, is, a, is an excellent example of that. So the, the only thing we can do is what? Make sure our clients are prepared for both. So we do that by what? Half their money in growth. Half their money in safe. And is, is our bond safe, guys? Do we consider bonds safe? No. A fixed insurance product is safe because it does not vary. It's extremely predictable. Okay? So I just saw this and thought we should just re <laughs> rehash this. Um, I also, I've, I've come up with the postcard, so if you want this, I don't know, Missy, do we have this, uh, where we have this on the site, but this is a warning, IRA CDs will be penalized in 2015, if you own more than one IRA CD, it's essential that you contact my office, blah, 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 
A recent U.S. tax court ruling makes anyone owning more than one IRA CD an IRS target for, uh, for penalties. This can cost you thousands of dollars in necessary and unfair taxes and penalties. So what are we talking about here, guys? So what are we talking about here? What happens in 2015? Yeah, that's right. Good job, Mick. The ro uh, rollover rule. Yep, Chris, you're right. The rollover rule. So if you have multiple CDs, if you roll one of those CDs, that's your one rollover. You roll over another one. So if you have them, if they have two CDs maturing the same year, they're going to get a hit with a huge penalty. So this is a great little, um, if you've got clients who are in CDs that you know are in CDs or uh, um, you've got a list of those people or whatever, this would be a, a thing to, to get their attention. So if you, and Missy, do you know where we have this? Trisha made it up for us. It's actually not out on the site, uh, to be honest with so you. They so need it. They can just, <laughs> just, they can just, uh, just email us at this point, or else um, we'll we'll find a home for it. But if you need it immediately, go ahead and email us, and we'll have to get it out to you that way. Yeah, yeah. I guess some people saying it's a stupid rule, but you're you're absolutely right. It is a stupid rule. But you know what? We make money when the government makes stupid rules, don't we? So I guess we know things that our clients don't know. So we'll get into our topic for the for the day. Three types of successful advisors. One is the kind of advisor who tells me they're successful because they have an 80% closing ratio. But if they have an 80% closing ratio, they're talking about one of two types of people. Referrals, well, that's great, but I've never heard of anybody really making tons of money with referrals. They basically make enough to survive. But the second type of person who says he has an 80% closing ratio is a guy who, who yeah, he gets 80% closing ratio, but how much does he get? 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 out of their total portfolio. So that's one type. Do, do you want to be that kind of uh, successful advisor, guys, where you only get 20, 30,000 every time you, you, you meet somebody? No, I wouldn't either, Jay. Second one is type of advisor is the one that gets all of the money. That's the kind we want to be. And third is we want to get all the money and referrals. That's the, the person we want to uh, 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 try to be and move towards. So. Henry Ford said this, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. So what do we mean by that? What did he mean by that? If I asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Yeah, not a car, exactly, Chris. Instead, he built what? Wild tees. And, and we, the, everything else is history. Steve Jobs said, it's really hard to design products by focus groups. A lot of times, people don't even know what they want until you show it to them. So what do you think my, why do I have these two quotes in here? Yeah, outside the box. Well, I would agree with that, Frank, but that, not really outside the box. So that's part of it. Because of this, what do I think about hot buttons, guys? What do I think about hot buttons? Exactly, Chris, they're bullshit. Why? Because here's the thing. We t I've talked about this many times. If a guy's walking through the, the airport and he's got cancer and he sees an article on cancer, will he buy that paper? If he's got cancer and he sees an article on cancer in USA Today, will he buy the paper? I got a yes and a no. Explain yourself, guys. Why will they or why will they not buy the paper? I've given you all the information I'm going to give you. He's got cancer. He's walking through the airport, sees a paper. Aha, Chris. Awesome job, Chris. Chris says he doesn't know he has cancer. So just because somebody has cancer doesn't mean they know they have cancer. See, I gave you all the information. He has cancer. Just because you have cancer doesn't mean you know you have cancer. So what's my point there, guys? Of the 21 things out there, before you even came on with 5Q, before you came on with 5Q, did you even know that you had the 21 problems we point out in the 21-point checklist? Let alone do you think our clients know or our prospects know they have these 21 issues? You know, when they come in, their hot button, how important is their hot button as compared to the 21 points that we point out to them? You know, they come in, it's like, uh, it's like a client walking into a doctor's office and saying, geez, I got a hangnail, take care of the hangnail, take care of the hangnail, and the doctor says, 
Holy cow. You got skin cancer. So now how much is the client worried about the hangnail? Hot buttons are irre irrelevant. They, that's right, Frank. They're irrelevant. Hot buttons are, are not, <laughs> yeah, Thomas says, not what you want to base your practice on. What we need to do is actually provide, because you know what, nine times out of ten, their hot button has nothing to do with what really ails them, but the 21-point checklist is. So we deal with two things. We deal with value and we deal with trust. If you do those two things, if you provide value, provide trust, you're going to have more money, more success, and help more people than you know what to do with. So value-wise, what we provide for value is the 21-point checklist. We talk about things that nobody else talks about, things that all 21 things. And guys, I would, remember we talked about here a couple of weeks ago when I went through the quick start. You should, be, you should have the truth and consequences coaching call in the archives memorized. Because any one of these 21 things can cause huge damage to them, to their family, to their pocketbooks. And they don't even realize it. They're walking around thinking they're hunky-dory. They don't even realize they have these problems. So we're providing unbelievable value to them. We're helping them avoid all sorts of problems they don't even know are lurking around the next corner. Okay, so that's how we provide value. But today, I want to talk about trust. See, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Do they really think, do people really think that one advisor knows more than another advisor, guys? Do they really think one advisor knows more than another advisor? Lots of right answers. They're all saying no, 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 no. Exactly right. They don't. Just like, do I really think one mechanic knows more than another? Do I think, oh my gosh, I don't know if I should take this mechanic because the one across the street might know more? Do I really worry about that? No, what I'm worried, what am I really worried about with a mechanic? Yeah, if you, well, no, not that if I can fix, guys, this drives me bananas. If I go to a mechanic, what do I expect the mechanic to do? So yeah, everybody else is getting it. I'm, no, not that he can fix the car. Guys, if I go to a mechanic, what do I expect him to be able to do? Fix it. Yes, everybody else is getting the right answer. I'm worried about him screwing me, overcharging me, charging me for things that I'm not worried about him fixing my car. If he's a mechanic, guess what I expect him to do? How long would he be in business if he couldn't fix a car? I'm not looking for the best mechanic. I know they can fix I'm, fi I'm looking for one, as many of you said, that are, is not going to screw me, who's trustworthy. So when a client comes to us as an advisor, do they really think one of us knows more than another? No, and if that's how you're going to base your practice, you're going to struggle, struggle, struggle. Guess how many guys I, I meet who think they're phenomenal investors? Guess how successful those, those guys are? All the guys that come to me and tell me they're phenomenal investors, guess how many of those guys are successful? Jay's got it right, none. Zero, Bob's got it right, none. Because, you know what? What did we just talk about, guys? What did we just talk about? Can anybody predict what the market's going to do? Can anybody beat the market? And if they spend all their time chasing the market, guess what? They're not spending any time doing what they're supposed to. You cannot manage accounts and be people, people at the same time. So we got to make a decision. And who are the most successful advisors out there? The ones that are 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 have all the research, spend all the time with their heads in a book, looking at the charts, are those the best advice, the ones that are making the most money, the ones that have the most happy clients, or the guy doesn't know what the hell's going on, but he hires that out, and he takes fantastic care of his clients, has time, talks to them, understands them, listens to them, has empathy. Which one is going to be better? Which one's going to make more money? Exactly. The one that spends time that's the people person, not the book person, face to face. So the numbers say it all. Recent research shows that uh, shows what affects people's systems buy from you. 55% is in your office space. I think that's a little heavy, in my opinion. 37 is based on nonverbal cues. I think that's way light, not a little light. I think that's way light. And 8% of the content on your content is the message, which I, which I believe is right. Because you know what? When people make a decision whether to, to buy from you, I have to go back here. It's not about your message. If it was about your message, how many clients would we all have, guys? If it was about the message, how many clients would we have? 
I mean, we show clients how they're doing wrong, you know, how we can make it better, how we've got a better idea. So if it's about our message, how many people would we, every person we met would be, want to come on with us? Exactly, Dino, as many as we want. So 100% of our, 100% people buy on your content, but only if they what? Trust you. And trust is far more important than your content. See, they buy with their gut, and then they validate their purchase with facts. We all know that, right? So, Cialdini's six principles all revolve around creating trust. Reciprocation, authority, scarcity, consistency, liking, consensus, those are all trust principles. So, how can we leverage these things to create trust? So here's the funny thing, and we've talked about this, I think, about two months ago. A goofed up seminar creates more or less appointments, guys. A, a, a seminar that's goofed up, projector breaks, whatever, you know, the, whatever happens, will that create more or less appointments? More appointments, Thomas, exactly. Why, Casey? Casey says yes. More, why? More human contact, Dale says, yep. Real person, to Casey says, yes. So when, when the projector breaks, all of a sudden you're forced to what? Yes, reliance on communicating. Exactly, Bruce. You communicate. Exactly, uh, Victoria. So uh, you t sit down and you have a discussion with them. Here's the thing, guys. If we could get away with it, I would, I would have your projectors break every single time because your, your appointments would go through the roof. Now, the problem with that <laughs> is that if people go to a presentation twice, they're saying, why is this guy's projector always breaking? But if I had my druthers, that's what I would do. Because it's not, it is not the slides they're buying. They're buying what? You. And if you're relying on the slides, you're relying on finishing the event, instead of communicating with the people in front of you, you're going to have far less success than if you rely on your ability to have discussion, talk to talk, real face to face, Frank. Exactly right, uh, uh, with, with the people you're sitting in front of. It's not about presenting, it's about communicating with them. So people buy from people they like. So let's talk about how we can make people like us. One is the, uh, the WOW office, right? So what do they see from your parking lot? Is your parking lot clean? Is it dirty? Where's the garbage cans? I mean, you've you got to make sure that when they pull up, they feel comfortable in your parking lot. Is your office easy to find? Now, here's the big thing. Is their name on the marquee? So the marquee can be electronic. It can be uh, simply a whiteboard with somebody writing their name. I welcome Mr. and Mrs. Smith on there. It, you can go to Costco or Sam's Club, and they have these little ones with the, the letters that you can stick into the, the uh, 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 back and spell out their names for it. Guys, this is such an easy thing to do, and it's huge. It's huge. So I've got a lot of people saying that they actually are using this and it works well. I can tell you, I cannot tell you, this has only happened one time to me. And how do you think it made me feel when I walked in and they had my name there? It made me feel huge. Yeah, and I've got a guy saying that, uh, that uh, Thomas is saying that they've had clients say this has never happened to them before. So if you're the first person that does that, guys, what is the most important word in the English language to people? What is the, their name, Frank? Exactly. So why not use that? How hard is that to do? Anybody that's not doing this, and I've mentioned it, geez, probably five times a year, get your butt out there. If you even buy a little whiteboard and say, welcome to Mr. and Mrs. Smith or whatever. Then, does your receptionist greet them by name? Hello, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. So if, if, they, if the, somebody has an, if the Johnsons have an appointment, at 10 o'clock, and somebody arrives around 10 o'clock, even if, the client, if your receptionist does not know the name of that person, what can they assume? That that is the Johnsons. So greet them by name. Do you remember the, the, um, the TV show Cheers? And Norm would walk in, and everybody would say, Norm! I mean, how would that feel if you walked into a restaurant and everybody knew who you were? This, people's names have huge power. Use it. Use the marquee. Make sure your receptionist greets them by name, okay? Client collage. What do I mean by that? So in, in my office, what was the only artwork that I had in my office? The only artwork that I had was a, 
uh, picture frame after picture frame full of my clients' smiling faces at my barbecues, at the Christmas lights tours. That's the only art I had there. What does that say? What does that art say when people walk into my office? I mean, can RI, guys, can RIAs have testimonials? See, RIAs can have the best testimonials available. Bruce, no, you're wrong. IRAs can have testimonials. What is a collage with a bunch of pictures of people happy as hell to be my clients, guys? What is that? That's an unbelievable, that's right, Bruce, it's, a, it's, it's an unbelievable testimonial. So your office should not have pretty artwork on there. It should have, you should be, first of all, if you're not having client events and taking pictures during those client events, you're crazy. And then put those pictures in collages so your people are surrounded in your office by people who love to be your clients. You're crazy if you're not doing this. And if you're an RIA, I'm sorry, if you're a, not if you're an RIA, but if you're a um, uh, registered rep, can registered reps have testimonials, guys? Yes, they can. Right, Thomas, they can. As long as they're not about what performance. So what kind of, do I want testimonies about performance? No. What I want, remember guys, why do people buy? What are they looking for? The highest rate of return, because they think I can get it for them? No. What, are the, what is the reason they buy from me? Because they what? Know I what? They know I what? Care. But they try. That's right, Thomas. That's right, Bruce. So guess what I want the testimonials to be about? That I care, that I'm nice, that I'm there, that I'm empathetic. Those are the kind. And wretched reps can have those testimonials. And so can insurance professionals. Okay, so that's what I want. I didn't have any magazines on my, my uh, coffee table. I had a testimonial book. Okay? No financial magazines. And if you, do have, uh, if you do have magazines, I just have the testimonial book. But if you have magazines, you don't want financial magazines. Have fun magazines. Travel. Uh, it just drives me crazy when people have Money Magazine or Wall Street Journal. What are you, an idiot? Have, guys, have you figured, have you done any of the research? When people read financial news, what happens to their stress level? Even when the market's going up, what happens to stress level? Goes up, always. Doesn't matter if the market's going down, going up, their stress level goes up. And they hired you to take care of their finances, so why are you feeding into their worry and their angst? Don't have financial magazines, newspapers, whatever in your waiting room. Have travel magazines, garden magazines, golf magazines, uh, whatever magazines, but not financial magazines. Does that make sense to everybody? What else should they see? So if I've got three appointments, guys, if I've got three appointments, how do I book them? This drives me crazy when I talk to advisors. And if they've got three appointments, I'll have one at 9, one at noon, and one at 3. I'm like, are you crazy? So all you guys are getting it right. You back to back. Right, Kevin? Right, you know. Right, Mick? You want them one after another. Why? Because as one's leaving, they see another one waiting. That gives them the, the image that you are busy in a successful person. So and besides that, why wouldn't you want to do that anyways? It's a better way to organize your day, isn't it? And that's why also you should get, when you use the system, you know that first meetings take one hour. Second meetings take two hours. So you, you can book your meetings that way. Okay? That's right, Thomas. So you're confident self-assuredness uh, because they see, see that. Book your appointment in clusters because it gives consensus, gives scarcity, gives authority, gives consistency. It's all, I mean, four principles of influence. Don't waste that. Now, when you greet them, shake their hand and hold them. Hold that hand an extra second or two. Just don't pump your, their hand. And, and, and if you can, hold their hand, shake it, and touch them on the shoulder. You found that the more you can touch somebody, the more they'll trust you. Make them feel welcome. Look them in the eye. And then I'll tell my assistant, hold all my calls. Now, guys. Have my, has my assistant ever interrupted me when I'm in a meeting? No. So why would I say hold all my calls then? Why would I tell her to hold all my calls if she's never in her whole life interrupted my, me in a meeting? So why am I going to still tell her, hold, it's right, Thomas. It makes them feel cared for. It makes them feel important. It's all theater. 
They see their name up on the marquee. The, the, uh, my uh, receptionist greets them by name. Then I say, hold all my calls for Mr. while I'm with Mr. and Mrs. Smith. What does this make them feel? What's happening to their, their resistance level? What's happening to their, their uh, uneasiness? Boy, when is the last time they've been treated like that? They're going to want to come back to your office all the time. Do you think they're treated that way at their current advisor's office? Do you? Do you think they're treated that way at their current advisor's office? You want to take a bet on that? There's no way they are. Oops, wrong way. Eye contact. Guys, there's been research upon research upon research about eye contact. It, when, you, when you look them in the eye, it shows confidence and awareness. It's meaningful, meaningful versus casual. Think of lovers. You know, when they, when they go out to dinner, what do they do? They look each other in the eye longingly, right? So you don't want to stare. There's a difference between staring at somebody and having eye contact. But boy, you know, we, we had an um, advanced sales training, geez, about three or four years, probably five years ago, where we had our top guys in. So we wanted to just uh, uh, train our top guys. And we had them, we were videotaping them, and we had them uh, uh, delivering both the, the first meeting and the second meeting scripts. And then we asked them over five minutes, we just had them doing it for five minutes, we said, how much eye contact do you have? And guess what they guessed? They thought they had huge amounts of eye contact. Guess what we found out? During a minute, guess how much eye contact most of them had? Less than 25% of the time did they have eye contact. They're looking at the paper, they're looking at, I mean, they're doing all this. You have to have eye contact, guys. And it's, it's odd. You know, if, you, if you concentrate on eye contact, it's odd what happens. And when, when I really uh, sent these guys home to work on it, virtually all of them, because I, I followed up two weeks later, virtually all of them said that as they were doing that with their dry cleaner, with the waitress, <laughs> with the, their clients, it changed the whole context of the, of the conversation. It's amazing. And then when we would drill on it, and we'd go back, and they, they still, even when they were concentrating on eye contact, and thought, oh, yeah, I did a lot better this time, they barely did any better. So eye contact is so, 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 so important. It's not staring. It's having eye contact. Their eyes are not a spot on their face. So you're looking at one eye. That, uh, when, when speaking less and listening, when breaking eye contact, don't look down. Instead, break with a smile or a laugh. So uh, when you look down, it looks like you're what? When you're, when you're having eye contact, you look down, it looks like you're uh, avoiding something. Okay? So this is actually a skill that, that guys, if you want to work on a skill, this is a fantastic skill to work on. If you go online, there's tons of information on how to have eye contact and how to use it as a tool. It's, it's, it's an unbelievable trust-building tool, and so few of us spend any time working on it. Oh, and, uh, yeah, Thomas is saying a smile. Guys, have they look, when, a smile is so important. Did you know that even the ugliest face, when it smiles, turns into a, ple a pleasant-to-look-at face? They've looked at smiles, smiles, smiles. Smiles is an indicator uh, of trust. It's an indicator of... Uh, of uh, pleasantness, and, and you got to work on your smiles as well, okay? And that's why when you listen to Bob, Bob's a tape here a couple of Fridays ago, he was laughing the whole time. He thought he sounded goofy. I didn't think so. I thought he sounded awesome because when you're, he, he sounded open and trustworthy. Uh, this is a guy I'd want to work with. And I know that we think we're professionals, so we have to be serious. No. New, 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 new. So, Jeff, can you get on, get on, please? So I'm going to get Jeff on here. Yep, I'm here. So would you explain, as a reminder, you know, when a trial attorneys choose their experts, is it based on seriousness and diplomas and credentials? No, it's actually based on who can explain things in ways that the jury can understand. So whoever explains it in layman's terms is the one that people tend to believe. 
So the person who's more, most approachable or the person who's most, quote unquote, expert? Nope, the most approachable. So guys, the, the, the trial attorneys spend millions and millions of dollars on figuring out what makes juries tick, what makes them believe one uh, argument versus another. And they found that juries believe has, has nothing to do with your credentials. They'll believe somebody from University of Minnesota versus somebody from Harvard if the guy from University of Minnesota is more, is, uh, it explains things in a way that they understand, is more approachable, is more an every man than the Harvard guy. Even though the Harvard guy might have 17 degrees, written 17 books, and the U of M guy is, is just a professor and has written nothing, to believe that professor because if he's more approachable, if he explains things in ways that people understand, if he's more likable than the, the expert. So smile and eye contact makes you likable. So what's behind your office, or your desk, I'm sorry, what's behind your desk? That's where I hang all my diplomas, is behind me. Have a round table, meeting table if possible. Now, when I say th th this round meeting table, I've, at this point, even if I have a round meeting table, where do I sit with from people? So, and Missy can validate this. Missy, did I have a round table, or did every client meet for me across a big square desk? You had a big square desk that every client met, ar um, met across from you. Because guys, and so uh, I shouldn't. This is this. Uh, I was. This is wrong. Have a round meeting table if possible is 100% wrong. So I apologize for that being in there. Because here's the thing, guys. If you go on a first date, first date with a girl, are you gonna? If you sat right next to her, what would that make her feel like? If you went on a first date with a girl and you sat right next to her, how would that make her feel? Awkward, exactly, Frank. Extremely awkward. When we go out on a date with somebody, even our, our spouse, how do we normally sit with them? How do we sit? Across the table, Bruce. Exactly, across, Dino. You know. Why? Well, why do we sit across the table from So we can do what? We just talked about it. Eye contact, Bruce. Exactly. So we have eye contact with them because that's how we communicate. That's how we see if people are telling the truth. That's how we see if people are paying attention. That's how we're seeing if people care from their eyes. So this whole stuff about meeting around a round table, which, I, again, I have in there, which is wrong, or sitting beside them so that there's no barriers between you is BS. People want to be comfortable, and they're comfortable when they sit across from you, so there's a barrier, a comfortable barrier, and that they can see your eyes. Now, what are they looking at behind me? They're looking at all of my diplomas and things like that. They're also looking at all of my books with the right titles. What do I mean by books with the right titles? They're all my financial books. Guys, I've seen, I've seen pictures of guys' offices, and in the back they have books about marketing. Do you want books about marketing behind you? What's the only kind of book you want behind you? Financial books. Testimonial letters would be a good thing to have hung up there. Do you all have my testimonial letter uh, from my, uh, as an author of the, uh, the book Who's on My Side hung up? You should. Why? Not because they'll know who I am. They don't know me from Adam. But it's a third party person who's endorsing you. Guys, let me ask you a question. Would you rather be the author of a book or have an author of a book endorse you? What do you think is more, more powerful? Being the author of a book or having the author of a book endorse you? What do you think is more, more powerful? Nope, not being the author. The endorsement is far more powerful. Why is the endorsement far more powerful? Use a higher authority. It's somebody, other, guys, when you write a book, it's all about who? Who's saying you're smart? Who's saying you're great? Who's saying you know what's going on if you write a book? You are. So what's that worth? Crap. But when somebody else says that you're great, why is that believable? Third party endorsement deal, exactly. So what's behind them? What do you, let's see if anybody can get this. What do you think is behind them? What do I put behind my clients as they're sitting there? Ah, Frank got it. Clock. Yep, Mike got it. Clock, clock, clock. Why? Because I will, first of all, I keep my first meetings no longer than one hour, second meetings no longer than two hours. So I stay on point, so I know where I'm at, but I never want to look at what? Never, ever, ever, ever look at what? Your watch, exactly, Frank. Right, Mike. 
So you can't, you got, so I have a clock behind them so I can keep on track. So, and what is everywhere? Pictures of my family. Why do I want pictures of my family all over the place? Because it shows that I'm a human being. What do I always have in my newsletters, my monthly newsletters? What is the first paragraph all about? Me and my family. The more they know you, the more they feel like you've in, they're, they're part of your family, the more they're going to trust you. Now, here's something that drives me crazy, and it only applies to a few people. But if you're doing this, stop it right now. Don't have pictures of yourself doing crazy things in your office. I've seen guys with pictures of themselves rock climbing. I've seen guys pictures of themselves uh, 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 parachuting. I've had seen people uh, picture of themselves hang gliding. Why don't you want that? I've got credibility. Why don't you want pictures of yourself doing crazy stuff? Might, might not be around? Risk, Trevor, exactly, risk. It's showing risky behavior. And they don't want to, their money being managed by somebody that seems very comfortable taking risky behavior. I'm not against that stuff. I love that stuff. But don't put the pictures or talk to your clients about it. Don't put the pictures up in your office or talk to your clients about it. Do it on your own time and keep it mum. Okay? Their experience. So what do I mean by their experience? You got to have a Keurig or a Tasimo or whatever. And then in, on our um, site, you can find the WOW manual. And it must be good because I've seen two other FMOs now copy my WOW manual. So it must be uh, worth, worth copying. So in there is a menu. And then you hand the menu to your clients. It's a menu of what kind of drink they want. So the importance of the menu is not the first time they choose something. What's the importance of the menu, guys? Where do I put that menu after they're done with it? The importance of the menu is not that first time we use it. In their file, exactly. The importance of the menu is the second time they come in and you remember what they drank the last time. So you say, hey, would you like the chai tea again? Hey, would you like the, uh, the uh, whatever latte again? How does it make you feel when somebody knows what you drink? How does that make, again, it's back to the marquee, your uh, receptionist calling them by name, you saying hold the calls. When somebody knows what you drink because of the last time, it's huge. So next time you know their drink, you could also get privately labeled bot, uh, bottles and you should have fresh baked cookies. Do you need an oven to bake fresh baked cookies? No, get a pizza oven, go to the grocery store, and buy both sugar-free and sugar cookies and bake them in the pizza oven. So why do you want that? What, what does it say? Guys, guess, where, guess what hotel my kids want to go to? The best hotel or Hampton Inn? Michelle and I are like, no, we want to go to this hotel. My kids insist, no, we're going to the Hampton Inn. Why? Because Hampton Inn has what when we walk in? Fresh baked cookies. Silly. But what, is fre you know, what do fresh baked cookies say to people? It's a, it's a it's a universe in the Western society, especially in America. It's a it's a you're welcomed exactly, Mike. So it's it's uh, safe and comfortable. Yes, it's a it's a it's ingrained in us that fresh baked goods offered is a a, a way to welcome people. And then how else do we uh, set up the uh, trust? Well, the first thing we do is we don't. Hey, let me tell you what's going to happen next hour or so. Do we say that? Let me tell you what's going to happen next hour or so. That is not what we do. We say, hey, would it be okay if I let you know what happened the next hour or so? What is that doing for folks? Well, first of all, we're taking control of the meeting with an iron fist and a velvet club. But what else is it doing for the people? It's saying, hey, nothing's going to happen without my permission. Oh, great. He's going to let me know what's going to happen over the next hour because I was worried about that. Oh, this guy is very courteous. Look at all the things that little question does. Hey, would it be okay if I share with you what happens in the next hour or so? Three or four levels of courtesy, of lowering their resistance, of letting them know that nothing's going to happen without their permission. Think about what that does. Is that setting up trust? But I'll hear guys say, yeah, yeah, Mike, I do that. Here, and I listen to the tape, and here's what they'll say. Hey, let me tell you what happens in the next hour or so. Is that what I'm asking you to do, guys? For you to tell them, hey, let me tell you what happens in the next hour or so. Is that what I'm asking you to do? When I... When you say, 
let me tell you what happens in the next hour or so. Is that a question or is that a statement? It's a statement. You've got to ask them. Right, Kevin? Right, Dino? You've got to say, would it be okay if I share with, with you what happens in the next hour or so? When you do that, it makes them feel, wow, this is different. This, is, this, is, uh, this guy cares about what we think. He's not going to make me do anything that I'm not comfortable doing. Oh, great. He's going to share with me what happens because I was worried about that. I was afraid he might, might pop something on me. Look at all the things that are happening with that little question, all allowing us to set up more what? Trust. I'm sure you have questions, and with your permission, I'll ask you a few questions. Remember, in that setting the tone script where we take control, it's a rhetorical question. We say, and with your permission, we'll ask you a few questions. It's, again, it's letting them know that what? Hey, nothing's going to happen without your permission. So in the first 30 seconds, we brought up permission twice, saying, hey, nothing's going to happen without your okay. We're not going to try to force you to do anything. You're going to know what's going to happen. I mean, look at all the things that we're doing there. Even though we're actually taking control of the meeting, we're also creating trust there because we're letting them know nothing is going to happen without their permission. How many advisors approach their first meetings this way? Hey, do you mind if I take notes or do you mind if I record this? Again, we're asking permission. So in the first 30 seconds, now we've asked permission three different times. And then if you later on, as you uh, uh, will learn more of the script, uh, we, we talk about, hey, half the people, you know, you might be wondering how I'm paid, half the people come to see me. They end up working with me in one shape, form, or manner. But half the people, just like you're sitting here today, will go home and do it all themselves, take it home and do it themselves. So I even let, give them another, because that's in the next 30 seconds or so, where we talk about how we're paid. And again, you don't need to worry about that. But I just want to show you that the whole script is set up. So in the first minute, we're just lowering one barrier after another barrier after another barrier by saying, hey, permission, permission, permission. And then we're going to say, half the people end up working with us, but half the people, just like yourselves, are able to take this information and go home. So what do we just told them? We've given them permission a fourth time to what? Take our information and go home. So when you do that, it sets up trust. And now we also talk about, uh, again, later on in the script, we appreciate you coming because your time is so valuable. So do you get, have you got some ideas? Are there some things that you can take from this call that maybe you'd heard about before, but you were so busy learning scripts, you were so, learning, so busy doing something that you forgot to put in place? Please go out and put some of these in place. Every little thing that you do adds a layer of trust. And I, I always talk about the scripts as an onion. I talk about gots as an onion. And I'm going to talk about trust as an onion. If I don't do one of these things, does it mean they're not going to trust me? No. I mean, if you're a cook, if you're a cook and there's one layer of the onion that's damaged and you peel it off, is that going to ruin the and don't use it? Is that going to ruin the recipe? No. How about if the next layer has to be uh, taken off? No. What about the next layer? No. What about the next layer? No. See, we, you can't really put your finger on how many layers of that onion you throw away before it affects the recipe. And because I can't put my finger on it, how many of those layers do I want to keep there? As many as possible. It's the same thing with gots. If you just forget one gots, that's not going to hurt you in the meeting. If you forget two, that's not going to hurt you. Well, depending on, right? If it's at the end, you're screwed. We, we pointed that out uh, with a guy doing, doing here about two, three months ago where he did everything right all the way up to the last three minutes and it all unraveled because he didn't do gots at the end. But in terms of the whole meetings with gots, if you miss one or two, does that matter? No. But the more you miss, the more you're missing the power or the flavor of the gots. The scripts. Do you need the scripts? Can you screw those up? Yeah. But the more you miss, the more you're missing the power of the scripts. Trust. The more of these things we talked about today that you don't do, not any one of them. You don't, if you don't have their name on a marquee, oh, they're never going to work with you if you don't have a name on the marquee. That's garbage. You know that that's not right because you've been bringing clients in forever without their name on the marquee. But what I'm saying is by doing these things, it makes, you, it, it makes your job easier. And really what we want is what? A stress-free experience for the client because when it's stress-free for your client, it's also stress-free for who? You. So do these things that we've talked about. The 21-point checklist provides the value, but all these other things we talked about provides the trust. So make it your goal over the next uh, couple of weeks to put more of these things in place. Is that a deal? Good. So I appreciate you being on the call. We'll cut it here about 10 minutes uh, short, uh, short, unless anybody's got any questions, concerns. I'll wait for 10 seconds, see if anybody... Uh, is it better to use their first names or Mr. and Mrs.? I, I guess that depends on the part of the country that you're in. In the Midwest, they feel weird if you call them Mr. or Mrs. They'd rather be called by their first names. I understand some places in the South are a little bit more formal, 
and they, they would prefer Mr. and Mrs. So you're going to have to base it on the area that you live in. I don't get what you're saying, Bruce. Start meeting with no surprises at seminar? What does that mean? I'm not sure what you're asking there. If spouse not at seminar, does it change? Oh, he's saying, do you start the meeting different if there's no spouse? And then if, if the spouse is not at the seminar, you know, how do you go into the first appointment if the, there was no spouse? Okay. Well, we have a uh, one-legger script that you use. So online is the one-legger script, so you use that one-legger script. So go to the agreement meeting, there's a one-legger script that you can use. Any other questions? Super duper. Then you guys have a fantastic uh, week, and we will talk to you on all, all on Friday. Thanks, everybody. And the wow, Dino, if you're still on, is underneath the archive library. Thanks, Dino. Oh, thank you, Lyle. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you Friday.